Good morning, celebration. Good to see you as always. Why don't we all stand up on our feet, put our hands together, help us raise a joyful noise. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. Salvation, tearing through the dead of night. See the kingdom burst into color at the speed of light. Freedom, shaking up the atmosphere As the shadows fade into nothing and the day appears Beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us The everlasting one, Jesus our God Waking up to kingdom come See the hope of heaven shining like the rising sun Now forever lifted up from death to life There's no fear in love and no darkness in his endless light the skies above, love reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God, oh we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, see His praises forever. above love reaching out for us the everlasting one Jesus our God beyond the skies above love reaching out for us the everlasting one Jesus our God This is where worship starts 
here in the temple of my heart remembering who you are and all you've done this is your majesty all i have tasted and i've seen remembering who you are and once again i see the lord forever glorified exalted and lifted high and all of your kingdom in christ you are you are the lord Not 
if you've ever taken time to think about why we take time in the beginning of our services to worship through music but there are a lot of biblical reasons for doing so the book of Psalms talks about the fact that God inhabits the praises of his people so when we come like this and we praise him it's kind of one way of just inviting his spirit to be here in a very real and present way but there's another verse in the Bible that talks about worship, it's in the book of John and it says that God is looking for worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. So as I sing those words this morning, Jesus changes everything. I have to look at my life and ask the question, is that true of my life and my experiences? And if I'm being totally honest, I don't always see the fruit of that truth. Not because of Jesus, because of me. You see, I've convinced myself that there are corners of my life that somehow can be, or maybe should be, hidden by the, from the Lord. 
but I hope you know there is no hiding anything from Jesus. So if we will just give him access to the fullness of our hearts and the fullness of our thoughts, the fullness of our lives, Jesus truly can change everything. So my challenge to us this morning, church, is that we would lean in as Pastor Mark brings his message today, that we would ask God that question, what do you wanna change in me in response to what I'm hearing? Because where we are is holy ground. And he is here and he does have the power to change everything. Amen? Yeah, we should be excited about that church. Would you join me now as we pray that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. You may be seated this morning. Well, if this is your first time at Celebration Church, we welcome you, whether you have walked into the doors of our campus or if you're joining us online, it really is our privilege to be able to worship with you this morning. We wanna let you know that Celebration Church is one church, but we have three different locations. We refer to them as campuses. Each of our campuses has their own time of live worship like this and communion and kids ministries. But what joins us all together is the teaching of our lead pastor, Mark Gunger, who typically preaches live here in Green Bay, but is watched via video by those um, at our campuses in Stevens Point in the Fox Valley. And of course, those of you who join us online as well. We do have one small ask of those of you who are joining us for the first time today. If you're in the room with us, you'll see that in the seat backs, there are little cards. If you're joining with us online, they're gonna pop up a link for a connection card. And we would love it if you would take just a moment to fill out some, some basic information about yourself on those cards. When you leave today, there will be buckets at the doors that you can just drop them in. Here's what we do with that. We promise not to hassle you at all. We just wanna send you a letter thanking you for coming and giving you a little bit more information about the church and some next steps that you can take if you'd like to find out even more. Uh, but again, we're just so thrilled that you would join with us. Thank you for coming and being part of Celebration Church this morning. I do have a few announcements to share with you as well today. My iPad turned off, so I have to remember what they all are. Um, it is that time of year where we have so many things starting to kind of kick back in, even though the rhythm of life feels different. There are certain rhythms that we just look forward to every year. Um, one is most of you know where we've been collecting celebration packs to provide Thanksgiving dinners to people in our community. Um, the due date for that is today, but if you have a pack that you haven't gotten back to us yet, or if you're online and, and not coming in, please know that you can get those to us anytime this week. Um, we will be delivering the rest of our packs out next week to families who are um, just looking for that help this Thanksgiving um, time of year. And we're just so grateful that you're part of that. If you would like to help us with distribution, um, there is a sign up for that online at our Facebook page or out on the counters here in Green Bay as well. Um, most of you also would have received a letter in the last week or so from Pastor Mark regarding our annual legacy campaign that's coming up. Legacy is that initiative that we have to just continue to set ourselves up for the future generations of Celebration Church. Our hope is that you'll just take some time in these next several weeks before we officially launch and just spend some time praying about and thinking about how you can maybe add us to your Christmas list this year and continue to be a part of Celebration Church ministry going forward. My name is Savannah. Welcome to Celebration Church. Whether you are here in person or online, we are so excited to have you joining us with worship today. 
This week is step three of our monthly growth track. At step three, you'll be introduced to the Celebration Dream Team and learn how you can be a part of a team that's making a difference by serving in dozens of ways across church life. Our team leaders will help you find the serve area that best fits your interests and abilities. Classes are online Monday at 6 p.m. and Thursday at noon. Our annual Women's Christmas Extravaganza will be taking place on the morning of Saturday, December 5th, with both in-person and virtual options this year. The Extravaganza is a beautiful way to start our Christmas season, and we are making every effort to bring you the warm spirit event you love in an atmosphere that will fit your comfort level this December. Tickets go on sale today in the lobby for our in-person events at the Green Bay and Fox Valley campuses. If you would like to connect with us virtually for the extravaganza or possibly host a small group in your home that morning, you can find information or purchase your ticket by visiting the events tab on the church website. For those of you who have recently decided to follow Christ and commit your life to Him, your next step is water baptism. Make sure you sign up online for a water baptism class this Tuesday at 7 p.m. We believe in the fellowship of believers. We say it every Sunday and we exercise it when we gather for church, but we witness its power the most in small groups. That's why we encourage everyone to get involved in group life this winter. We're eagerly looking for those of you who are naturally love or care for people to join our team of small group hosts and leaders. We're holding orientations this Thursday at 7 p.m. You can sign up using the class registration link on the homepage of the church website or by stopping at guest services after service. However you are joining us for church, make sure you visit the Church at Home tab on our website. We have weekly messages for preschoolers, grade school kids, and youth. Church at Home also has plenty of other options to help you stay connected this season. We are so excited to have you here with us today. Please enjoy the service. This is Celebration Church, but it's more than just a building or a church. We have a calling to be a place where people can find a relationship with God instead of religion. A place where freedom is found and acceptance given and every person can discover their purpose and experience the kind of fulfillment only God can give. Together we will raise, lead, and empower a generation to change the world. Here, Jesus is famous and all the glory goes to God. This is celebration. This is our family. Welcome home. Good morning. Welcome to Celebration Church. Let's all stand together as our campuses join us with us over in Stevens Point and the Fox Valley, as well as all of those who watch us online back home yet uh, during this pandemic. Glad to have you with us this morning. And all the people who watch us all over the world. Uh, glad to have you with us. Let's uh, start by reciting together the Apostles' Creed. This is our statement of faith. This is who we are and what we believe at Celebration Church. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who for us and for our salvation was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the fellowship of believers, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good to have you with us this morning. And I can assure all of you that no animals were harmed in the creation of this jacket. <clears throat> Before we go on, with our service, we want to pause for a moment to remind everybody about the offering and to give you a moment to be able to participate uh, online. Um, many of you use the uh, app uh, that you get on your phone. There's a celebration app. If you don't have that on your phone, that really makes it easy, actually. Uh, there's also text to give, where you text to 77977. That's the number you send it to, 77977 and type CCWI in the message, and then the dollar amount, and send it, and you can give that way. Many of you are involved in recurring giving, and that's the best situation for the church, then everything we can budget accordingly. Many still send in their checks. Uh, many of you uh, in the live services can still give on the way out. There are buckets. We don't pass them around now. 
because of all this stuff, but uh, you can still give that on the way out. Uh, and, uh, and we appreciate you supporting the church so that we can continue to do what we do and to celebrate the gospel of Jesus and bring it to a very lost and dying world. So I'm going to say amen. <clears throat> also, keep in mind, uh, coming up is going to be our legacy campaign, our annual campaign. Do uh, Start thinking now. Don't just oh, be surprised when it gets there. Start thinking now. What can we do special this year uh, for Christmas for the kingdom of God? Something above and beyond. You say, well, I normally give. That's fine. This is the above and beyond what you normally give. Something that you can do. Be as generous as you can. The more generous you are, the more generous God will be back to you. It's a very strong biblical principle. Uh, most struggle with it, but it works. And it's really amazing. So uh, start thinking about now. What can we do? Plan accordingly. Be intentional. Don't be an inspirational giver. <clears throat> you know what I'm talking about? There's people who, if you can tell a really great, sad story, they'll cry and they'll give. <clears throat> and uh, I don't do that. I know lots of churches that do that because they've trained their people to be inspirational givers. If you can tell a sad enough story, then they'll give. Uh, and, and we don't do that. This isn't supposed to be based on emotion. You're supposed to be an intentional giver. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. If I tell a sad story, that's, that's a bonus. All right. <clears throat> but... Uh, <laughs> Don't be driven by your emotions on everything in life, for heaven's sakes. Uh, and then one last thing, and, and I say this kind of hesitantly because I don't know the whole facts. And as you know, things get exaggerated one way or the other. But uh, it has come to my attention that there were some people here last week wearing a mask, and some people around them were talking loud enough to criticize them for wearing the mask, and they felt very offended by it. exactly how it happened, who these people were that even said it, who knows? Just remind you, we don't do that to people, okay? Be nice. I don't care if they come in hazmat suits. You have dad, mom, and all the kids in little tiny hazmat suits. They come sit down and just say, it's so good to see you today. That's all you say. Other than that, keep your mouth shut. I don't think they come running in like Bubble Boy. Yeah, how many you remember Bubble Boy? So you, yeah. With John Travolta, was that it? <laughs> he had something that, you know, he had to be in a bubble all the time. He was called Bubble Boy. And now the whole world's trying to turn us into a nation of bubble boys. But anyway, I'm going kicking and screaming along the way. But anyway, Amen. yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but be nice to the bubble boys, all right? <clears throat> um, this morning, reading from uh, the Old Testament, reading first uh, Judges, the book of Judges. Now, uh, the beginning of the Bible starts with Genesis, which is not the beginning to explain how we all got here. Uh, it doesn't really go into lots of detail about how we got here. Uh, people argue about it, but it wasn't set there to be argued. It's just like this is, God did all this. But the main focus is actually where did the Jewish nation come from? And it gets into Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, eventually hits Joseph at the end of um, Genesis. And boom, they all wound up in Egypt. They want to show you how did they end up in Egypt. It's a historical account. This is how we got here. They were then slaves for 450 years. Moses comes, gets them all out of there. And they come out. And then they eventually go in and take the promised land. Why do we call it the promised land? Because God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they would get in this land. Took a while. <laughs> a lot of generations before they got there. And let's face it, sometimes... It can be a little frustrating that things take as long as they take. Uh, I would like things to be done right now, uh, but uh, sometimes it just takes a while. We've got to be patient. And anyway, so they finally go into the promised land, and now they're there. And as I mentioned last week, uh, Moses gave them a choice. Look, if you'll do the right thing, God will bless you. You'll have life. If you do the wrong, if wrong things, the wrong things will happen to you, and it's going to be death. And they had to tell him, choose life. Don't choose death. And they said, okay, okay. So they get there, and now <clears throat> they're supposed to be living happily ever after, if you will, in this incredible land that they've taken. Uh, but it doesn't take long before they all start doing the bad things. <laughs> and then bad things would happen to them. And they'd cry out to God, and then uh, he'd send someone to help them, and then straighten things out, and things would be good. And then they do bad things again. And this goes over and over and over and over. Now, this is before they get a king. First king is Saul, then King David. Solomon, and then all the kings and stuff. Uh, 
which you can read about in the book of Kings, two books of Kings in the Bible, all historical accounts. Anyway, during this season between when they got in the promised land and before a king showed up, they were ruled by what was called judges. These people, God would use some of these people, judges, to get them out of the trouble that they would find themselves in because they would keep being disobedient. Anyway, so we get to Judges chapter 4, uh, and we're reading about these various judges. Judges chapter 4 is interesting because this is a female judge. Ooh, look at that. Uh, God can use women. What a shocker. All right? And, and we'll talk more about that in just a second. But so anyway, we're reading. In chapter 3, we finish up reading about Ehud, who was this guy, and uh, God had used it because they were being disobedient. Horrible things would happen. They'd cry out to God. God would send someone, a judge, deliver. And the last one was Ehud. And then everything was good again. And then, very next chapter, the very verse first, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. This was nonstop. They would do evil. Just everything would go wrong in their lives. They would cry out to God. God would deliver them. And as soon as everything got comfortable, they would do evil again over and over and over again. All right? So they did evil in the eyes of the Lord now that Ehud was dead. Uh, Israel, for some reason, struggled not. I want to take a look at this thing. The, the one temptation they kept having over and over and over again is they were tempted to get into idol worship. Uh, and it, this was a stumbling block to them over and over again. Now, I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking about it. I'm talking to some other pastors about it. And, and, I, and I, I said, what was the temptation? What was the draw about worshiping idols, this, this whole idol problem that they had? Because virtually every sin the Bible talks about we have all felt a temptation in one way or the other, all right? Not all of them, but many of them. But you feel that. To this day, we feel tempted to do things. But I have never, ever, ever, ever walked by a statue and had this overwhelming urge to go, hullaba, 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 hullaba. You know, sounds, and I don't even know anybody who's ever felt anything like that. If you had, don't raise your hands. But uh, so what, what the heck is this? What, what is it? It keeps getting him in trouble until you start to look at it closely and see what it was all about. The whole thing about paganism and idol worship, two major points. Number one, um, the temptation was an overwhelming desire to be like everybody else around them. The one thing about God from the beginning said, listen, you will be my people, and even today we're supposed to be his people. And that means you won't be, we will not be like everybody else around us. We just won't be. And people really struggle with that because there is this overwhelming desire to want to be liked and appreciated by as many people as possible. And that, sometimes it's the most of the people. It doesn't even have to be most of the people. Sometimes it can be a very small group of people. You want to so be identified with that group of people that you start crossing the line and be more interested in making that little group of people happy or my group of friends or my grandma or whatever, relatives can be a big thing. There's something that pulls us away from our faith for this desire that I want everybody to like me or I want a certain group of people to like me. And this is an overwhelming uh, pull on our hearts still to this very day. That's why Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 32, he says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. What is he talking about? This is this thing that sits in all of us. That when it comes, push, comes to shove, because our flesh, this is still, this, this is all going to die. So this is irredeemable. This is how bad sin is in us. And we still struggle with it to this day, even if you're a person of faith for 50 years. This will still fight you. Uh, this wants to be identified with wrong uh, more than it wants to be identified with right. So oftentimes you get around situations and, and you would rather, there's a, a part of us that wants to disown Jesus and don't let anybody know I'm for Jesus because we feel this weird pull in us. And Jesus warns, about it, warns us about it. Paul, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to a Timothy, 2 Timothy, his second letter to Timothy, chapter 1, verse 8, he says, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Well, why? Because there is something in us, that, there's something, and, and I didn't go into all the verses and stuff because I don't need to go into all the verses to explain it, but there's something about being identified with Jesus and the cross that is, Paul often refers to as the sense of shame. 
There's a sense of shame. In the natural world, when you start proclaiming Christ or standing up for Christ, you'll feel sometimes, and, and the devil's really good at this, trying to put you into situations where you feel a little embarrassed. If you have ever felt a little embarrassed for being a Christian around the people that you're at, don't worry about that. That's, that everybody experiences this from time to time. The problem is don't give in to that. You know, it's like times you feel like punching someone in the face. That's okay. Don't punch them in the face. That's the problem. All right? Uh, so we all have temptation. We're not supposed to yield to them. But there is this sense. There's this sense of shame, if you will, of connecting with a God that nobody can see. And, and most of the people in a certain group or all groups uh, don't like this God that you are connected with and this way of living and the way that you think. And there's a sense of embarrassment sometimes that comes with it. Uh, sometimes you young people will feel that in school and stuff. And then you feel really bad for feeling this way. And I'm saying, it's okay. It's just a natural thing. But you don't want to give into it. You don't want to hide your faith, stick it under a bushel, if you will. Or as Jesus said, disown me. Are you a Christian? No, no, man, I'm not a Christian. You know, my, my parents are, but I, you know, they drag me to church, but I'm not, you know. And why do people take the stand? Often because they're just ashamed and they give into it. Some really good people, by the way, have done this. You remember Peter? Yeah, a little issue there. Same kind of thing. It's, I'm just telling you, it's there. Best to acknowledge that it's there. Okay, I get it. That's one of the things that we face. But from the beginning, God has told, told the children of Israel, you're not like everybody else. How many of you had parents that had to tell you that? Any of you? Really, that's all? Oh my goodness, I, I was drilled in that. You're not like everybody else. You're a gunger. I don't know what that meant, but that's what we all heard growing up. I, you, I expect something from you. Okay. Well, everybody else does it. I don't care. You're not like everybody else. You're my kid. I can't kill them, but I can kill you. You know, and, and there's this thing, and God has had this thing. You're my children. Be careful. He warns them over and over and over. Don't be like everybody else. And as soon as they get into this culture and they get into this promised land, they are overwhelmed with the sense and desire, I want to be like everybody else. Or I want to be like this group or that group. And even though they know it goes against their own faith and what God has called them to do, oftentimes they give into it. Because that desire, I'm telling you, it's very, very strong. This thing that I'm talking about, it's no small deal. And you young people, the younger you are, the more this will be present until you finally settle into who you are as an adult. But it can be overwhelming. And don't let it suck you down the rabbit hole because it can be very, very destructive in your life. But I, you need to know, we need to acknowledge, this is real. This is very, very real. And that's what the children of Israel are constantly getting sucked into. So number one, there was this overwhelming desire. I want to be like everybody around me. And Israel kept falling for this over and over and over again. And they would start acting in very destructive ways that were against what God had said, but they did it because they wanted to be like everybody else who was doing that. So the number one thing about that is they wanted to be like other people. And, and remember, I mean, he was, he was really strong. Uh, God, he says, you, you can't even intermarry with these people. I mean, they were really strict back in the day, okay? Uh, and for various reasons, but uh, we won't get into that. But, uh, and sure enough, one of the first things you'll see as you read this is they start dating all the chicks from these other places. <laughs> and guys are all intermarrying and pretty soon they're all, hullaba, hullaba, hullaba. they're all getting caught up in this uh, destructive stuff. And the other major uh, mark of paganism was sexual in nature. Uh, paganism, if you study it at all, uh, and I will not get graphic, thank God, but it, it, they did things of a sexual nature Virtually everything you can think of and a whole lot of stuff you would never think of, and I won't tell you what they all are, but they were into it up to their eyeballs. And one of the things that marked that kept causing Israel to sin was this freedom of sexual experimentation, stuff that they could do. And we always have to, and the Bible warns us, the New Testament, over and over and over, kind of gloss over it a little bit because it's embarrassing to speak about it. And, you know, Christians, you know, like you can never talk about sex in front of Christians. You know, we don't have sex as Christians. Every birth is a miracle. I don't know how this even happens. <laughs> but it's a very strong temptation. And I know a lot of people, they never talk to their kids, but talk to your kids about this. 
and be honest with them. Now, I cannot tell you, and, and many of you have experienced this firsthand, growing up in church, I've talked to so many people who struggle in their marriage sexually because all their lives they went to some little conservative church and all they ever heard was sex is bad, sex is bad, sex is bad, sex is bad, and then they got married and said, okay, go for it. And, and they struggle. I mean, 10, 20, 30 years into the marriage, they, they struggle because they had this drilled into them. We do not tell people that. I've never told our young people sex is bad. I, it's, I'm a big fan. Okay? <laughs> I, I gotta tell you, it's, it's really nice. It really is. It's, it's quite delightful. But it, 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 it yeah. But, but you want to do it right because something so powerful has a real negative consequences that come with it. And it can scar you emotionally. It can scar you physically with, you know, how many diseases they have on this. You know, I see all these advertisements on television for herpes and all these other sexually transmitted diseases. And don't raise your hand if you got it. I mean, that's, I, no, nobody hates you, but I bet if you have it, you wish you didn't. I'm pretty sure you'd sign up for that. And, and it'll, it hurts you and physically and just one stupid thing and now you're carrying this miserable thing. Some of it can really damage you physically, seriously lead to cancers that will kill you. Uh, AIDS itself that you get through sexual uh, with the wrong person and you don't know who has it can kill you. It's, I mean, it's got serious, and it, you don't even have to go that far. Just some of the mental and stuff that you go through and the scarring is just not worth it. It's great, but do it right and enjoy it all the days of your life, all right? But do it right. And, and the thing is, they got pulled into this because it's a very, very powerful thing. I mean, what do they say? Sex sells, right? If, if you have a tractor and you put a picture of a tractor, it doesn't sell as much unless there's a babe next to the tractor. You know, and now, oh, look at that tractor. Of course, you're not looking at the tractor. Oh, yeah, there is a tractor in that picture. And, and this is, it's a, it is one of the most powerful forces in human experience. Uh, we need to acknowledge it. We need to talk frankly about it. And we need to encourage, do it right. And, and warn, because it can get you in all kinds of trouble. And they got pulled into it. Uh, and the Bible says, look, there is pleasure found in sin, in all kinds of sin. Uh, but the backside of it, it usually doesn't last very long. If you're really mad at somebody and punch them in the face, it really feels kind of good. Temporarily. <laughs> Maybe for a long time, I don't know. Until <laughs> the cops are dragging you off to jail. <laughs> then it doesn't feel so good, you know. And all kinds of things. It all feels good for a little. And sex is very strong, very powerful, very, oh, that feels really good. Uh, but then you have this dark side that kicks in. The Bible talks about it in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 24. By faith. Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. It's pretty clear. It's not saying there's no fun in sin. It's saying, yeah, but it's fleeting. It passes. It doesn't last long. Now, it has varying uh, degrees of it, but uh, most people who've lived in these kind of lifestyles, uh, there is a point where it just, is empty. It becomes hollow. It is not satisfying. And uh, it's very painful. And, and people of faith have always struggled. Not just the children of Israel. Even early Christians really struggled with this paganism thing. But mostly from the sexual side. Um, in 1 Corinthians, Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. And if you ever feel discouraged as a Christian because you don't do things very well, read Corinthians and you'll feel pretty good about yourself. Because these people were jacked up. They had so many problems going on. It's amazing. God just didn't kill them all. Be thankful I am not the Lord. I would kill so many people. So anyway, um, the, and their problem was it was very common to go to prostitutes. But it was, it was, they were temple prostitutes. And they were all over the place. It was part of pagan worship. You, you would worship the demigod by, uh, let's have sex with this girl. And a lot of guys liked going to church back in those days. Because this, this was, you know, it, it, it just appealed to their worst nature, right? Their sinful nature, this pull, and they would do this. And Paul had to write them and said, you, because the early Christian guys were doing this. He says, don't you know, this is 1 Corinthians 6, chapter, verse 15. Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. 
Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute, or anyone for that matter in a sexual way, is one with them in their body? For it is said the two shall become one, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. Why? Because it will suck you in. Don't play with it. Run! Run! All right? Never mind. <laughs> Had a little story, but I'll let that one go. Flee sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Now, we've all heard this, right? Our temples are the temple. Uh, we have to take care of our temple. We need to exercise and take vitamins and, you know, go for walks and eat salads because the Bible says our body is a temple. Yeah, he's not talking about vitamins. He's talking about don't be doing a wild thing with prostitutes. That's what he's talking about when he says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. He says, uh, you are, uh, who whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This thing, he was encouraging him over and over again. So paganism appeals to the greatest weaknesses that people have. To be accepted and fit in with everybody else around you, even if it's a small group of people that you want to be around, you so desperately want to be accepted and fit in and be cool with them that it pulls you in. Uh, that's a big weakness. And the other one is for uh, ex sexual experimentation. And, and I get it. It is a very, very strong pull. Now, all of that was verse 1. There's a bunch more verses, but it'll go much faster. So here we go, verse 2. Going back to Judges now. So the Lord, because they're being so disobedient again, sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan. Now, he didn't actually sell them, so figure speech. But he basically said, okay, hands off. And then all of a sudden they find themselves uh, under this king of Canaan by the name of Jabin. Uh, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in... I'm not going to pronounce all these words. <laughs> it's just south of Krivitz right there, wherever that is. A, because he had... And, and Sisera was this big Yomama commander, and he had 900 chariots fi fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. And they cried out to the Lord for help. And, and when they say cruelly oppressed, I mean, this is a barbaric time in the world. These people. I mean, think of the worst movies you've seen with these warlords and everybody tearing and terrorizing people and killing people and raping and pillaging. This is what they did to them. And for 20 years, and they start crying out to the Lord. Now, Deborah, a woman, a prophet. Can women prophesy? Apparently. So, this woman who was a prophet of God, she was the life, wife of Lipidus. <laughs> Aren't those statins that you can take? <laughs> and uh, was, <laughs> was leading Israel at the same time. So, so Deborah, she's leading Israel. She's the lady in charge. How this happens, I don't know. Because this is, this is not 20th century, 21st century America. This is thousands of years ago. And women, you think some of them struggle today. Man, back then, it was unbelievable. But there was something about this lady. She was so wise. She was so powerful when she would speak. And she was a prophet of God. And God would speak this way. And everybody listened to Deborah. So she held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, uh, which is in Door County. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. So if you're having a problem and you can't get along with your neighbor and this guy's ripping me off, and they would go see Deborah and come and make their cases, and she would rule over them. She was the judge uh, over them. And uh, so anyway, she sends for Barak, son of whatever, and all these names, and said to him, the Lord God of Israel commands you. So if God is speaking through her as a prophet. Tells Barak, go take with you 10,000 men from Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to, the, up to Mount Tabor. And then the Lord says, I will lead Sisera, this yo mount big guy, commander of Jabin's army with his chariots, all this stuff, uh, and his troops. I'm going to lead them to the Kishon River and I will give them into your hands. And I was like, I'm going to lead them there and then you guys are going to pounce on them and wipe them all out. That's what the Lord says. And, and why? Because they've been crying out to God to deliver them after 20 years of t torturous behavior 
and finally turning away from their sin, which kept getting him in trouble. And he says, okay, this is what you need to do. Well, Barak says to her, I'll go. If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Now, he really gets slammed here. And throughout history, he's been slammed as being kind of a wuss. But uh, Deborah says, well, yeah, I'll go with you. But because of the course you're taking, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman, which was really insulting back then. It, look, it just is what it is. Uh, but he didn't care. He was afraid. At least he went. But he only went if she would go with him. Uh, she slams him for not being a man about it. But uh, on the other hand, if she was that highly respected and you knew this woman spoke when she was speaking, it was the words of God, that's a big comfortable blanket to take with you. You know what I'm saying? So I'll go, but you got to come with me. So all right, but I'll get the credit. And he didn't care. So, uh, so verse nine, she says, certainly I will go with you. But because of the course you're taking, the honor will, be, uh, will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver sister into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There Barak summoned Zebulon and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command, and then Deborah also went with them. So now we jump to verse 14. Then Deborah says to Barak, Go, this day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak, under her words, he felt comfortable doing it. So he went down Mount Tabor with his 10,000 men against this massive army of Sisera. And he is, you know, a big commander. And uh, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. Uh, so he basically, Israel just starts wiping them out. It is a one-sided battle. God is so on the side of them. They are destroying this army that has been torturing all the people. And then Sisera, he freaks out and he gets down from his chariot and he runs away because he wants to survive, obviously. And very common in these days, the commanders would pull back and try and save themselves if everything's going wrong. I'm not sure how the rest of the army felt about that, but that's what they would do. Uh, so uh, anyway, Barak pushed pursued the chariots and army as far as all these names. And all Sisera's troops fell by the sword and not a man was left. They wiped them all out. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot and he went to the tent of Jael. This lady, she's the wife of Heber the Kenite because there was an alliance between Jabin and the family of Heber. So there's an alliance. So he goes to this little village, you know, again, a very crude, barbaric days, but he comes to this village. He knows that they're in alliance, so he runs over to them, and uh, uh, Jael went out to meet Sisera, this lady, said, come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket to warm him up. He says, I am thirsty. He said, please give me some water. Well, she opened a skin of milk, uh, gave him a drink, and, and covered him up. You know, if I'm really thirsty, warm milk won't do it for me. <laughs> Seriously, it would just gross me out. But anyway, that's what she, because they didn't have refrigerators, right? Here's some warm milk. Try this for your drink. So anyway, so she covers him up. And then he says, stand in the doorway of the tent. If, if anybody comes by and says, is there anybody in there? Say no, because he's hiding. He's freaking out. Now, <laughs> JL, she's very aware at this point. When Sisera comes up and he's running on foot, things didn't go well for him. So he, she knows that his army has been defeated and his butt has been kicked. So he, she's being, oh, come in, have a, uh, give him some milk, you know, a little cocoa and puts him to bed. And uh, uh, Jael picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast to sleep exhausted. And while he's sleeping, she drove the pig through his temple into the ground. And he died, I bet. Just then, Barak came in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said. I will show you the man you're looking for. And so he goes with her, and there lay Sisera with a tent peg through his temple, dead. Very, very gross um, uh, and awfully graphic. And of course, the only reason she does this is because she knows the power has shifted. And like so many people, therefore, whoever's winning, you know, uh, 
they're the fair weather fans. <laughs> so anyway, all of this to show how God destroyed this, this horrible army that has been terrorizing Israel for 20 years. This is no small deal. It wasn't like, you know, they were, you know, they couldn't vote freely or so. I mean, these people, their lives were terrorized by these people. And they cried out to God and then shows how God delivered them. So the very first verse tells us of Israel's struggle with paganism. And then after this, they do it again. And then after this, they do it. And this is where you get, you know, Samson comes along and all these different people come along who would do these great things and Israel would repent and then they would do it again. And it just never ended. Then you get into the book of Kings, which will probably eventually get there. Uh, and they had the same problem over and over and over again. And it's just, it's just because that pull of paganism, they just couldn't say no to it. And it destroyed them. And, they, and then finally, uh, they all wound up in a very bad place, lost their whole nation, uh, and, and they finally straightened it out. And then that's when Jesus comes. Anyway, okay, so um, one little tiny verse to tell us of Israel's struggle, uh, and then um, the rest of the chapter of how God will do whatever is needed to save us when we call on him. Now, no matter what, uh, you have to always understand if you give in to the temptations around you, that there's always forgiveness with God if you'll call out on him. Always. Uh, and you always have a home here. And I've told this to our young people, many, you know, for years, whenever they would graduate, I always say to them, look, all your life we've taught you how to live. Uh, but if you don't listen to us and you go out and do whatever you, you need to understand, you still have a home here. Don't ever think I can't go back there because I've done all these things wrong. And I've used the analogy of Humpty Dumpty. So you might come back in a million pieces, uh, but we will take all the king's horses and all the king's men and put you back together again. You might look a little cracked, but you'll still be back whole, okay? Because there's consequences, right? You know, you go through in your life, you know, and you've been through five husbands and everything, you're just a mess. There's a bunch of wounds that you will carry, but there's always forgiveness and there's always healing and we celebrate that. Now that sounds warm and fuzzy, but you have to understand there's people who've been part of our family that have done some really bad things in this church. Adulterers, thieves who've been arrested and thrown in jail, ex-cons. We've got a bunch of ex-cons here. Don't raise your hand. All right. Uh, you know, child pornography, arrested and stuff like that. That stuff really makes people mad and I get it. But you have to understand if people come with forgiveness, they still have a place here. Now, obviously, we wouldn't put them in charge of children's ministries or anything like that. But, uh, and you think we have problems. You know, oh, I'm tired of forgiving this guy. Stop and think. We, you know, throughout the last 2,000 years, you hear about people who have been tortured and killed martyrs for Christ. Think of the scenario. Someone comes and says, turn your back on Jesus or I will kill your children in front of you. And they refuse to do it and they kill them. And they come to the next guy. Turn your back on Jesus or I'll kill your children. They go, no, no, I don't care about Jesus. And they say, we remember the martyrs. and, and Well, we forget part of the story. It's not talked about very often. Is that oftentimes later, these other guys would come back to the church. And they would come back in tears and ask to be forgiven. And they forgave them. You think you have a hard time with people? Can you imagine looking at the guy who stood next to you? His children are still alive, but yours are dead because you didn't refuse Jesus, but they did. But now they come back. You don't think they have a problem with that? This forgiveness thing, it can be tough. But the power, the glorious thing that we celebrate, that there's always forgiveness at the table of the Lord. Amen. Jesus will end with this last verse. He said, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders off, what's he going to do? Will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? It's amazing. Jesus often talked, the people would criticize him, the Pharisees. Why are you spending time with sinners? You know, they're, they're bad people. Why, why are you hanging out with these bad people? He says, because it's the sick that need a doctor, not the well. You know, and Jesus would go on and say, the angels of heaven rejoice over just one person that comes home. And all the parables of the prodigal and son. If there's one thing that we know about God is he'll always reach out to you no matter where you are, no matter what you've done. Now, we warn you, don't go down these paths because they are very painful paths. But never think that we shut you off. 
that you can't be here. No, we don't think in those terms. I don't care whatever kind of life you've done, whatever you, you can, you always have a home here. There's always forgiveness in Jesus. And we celebrate that and thank God for that. So having said that, let's turn into our time of communion. This is when we celebrate this thing that we call forgiveness. Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world. All of them, even the people you don't like, he did it. And, uh, and we celebrate this forgiveness that we have. His, and then before uh, he was crucified, he had the last supper. He took the bread, said, this is my body broken for you, broken so we could be whole. My blood shed so you can have forgiveness of sins. So whenever we take communion, before we take communion, we pause for a moment. And we just ask God for forgiveness. Why? You know, we're people. This last week, if you're like most people, <laughs> you've said or thought of it, something you shouldn't have. Uh, what do we do? We come to the cross. We come to the table of the Lord and we ask for forgiveness. And I'm going to pray a general prayer, prayer of forgiveness. And while I do this, if, if you can think of something specific you shouldn't have done or something you did do, ask God to forgive you on, in your own words. Let's, let's set things right right now. You say, well, Pastor, I've done it a million times. It's okay. Well, I, what I said was really, really mean. I understand. You'll need to make it right with them, but there's always forgiveness. No one has ever turned away who call upon the Lord. Let me pray this prayer of forgiveness over all of us. Father, before we partake of the bread and the cup this morning, and in obedience to your scriptures, we pause to examine ourselves. If we have sinned against you in any way, thought, word, or deed, something that we've done, something that we didn't do that we should have done, if we haven't loved you with our whole heart, if we haven't loved our neighbors as ourselves, for the sake of your beloved son, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins, have mercy on us, Lord, and forgive us of all our sins. Strengthen us in your goodness, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. And as our heads are still bowed, maybe if you're listening this morning, maybe you've never talked to God in this way. Maybe you've never asked him into your life, whether you're in our, one of our campuses right now or watching us from home or on the internet somewhere. Uh, just ask Jesus to come into your life. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Say, I'm sorry, for forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. And you can start to experience this wonderful thing of faith that we've been celebrating this morning, that we're talking about. Despite our mistakes, he'll show us how to live a blessed life. But if we mess up, there's forgiveness and there's grace. And you can enjoy that with us today. Amen. So I'm going to ask... Uh, everybody at home to get ready to join with us committed. The majority of our church still is at home um, and it's quite a bit. Uh, I think the numbers are six, seven hundred a week that are online. I was looking at one guy last night his picture of them watching us online at home and there's four of them in the family. I mean, you could take 600 times four. That's the, there's a good 2,000 people no doubt that are not and that's okay. If you don't feel comfortable, that's fine. Obviously, the people here do. We're good either way. Uh, but those of you at home, the biggest part of the church, uh, while, we, while the band's singing and getting stuff, get your stuff ready for communion, uh, the bread, the wine, whatever you're going to use. And then uh, when we come back, then we'll all take communion together. If you're at our campuses, we give you these little pre wrap things. If you haven't done it before, uh, it's two layers. The first little layer is, gets you the bread, and the second little layer gets you the juice. So uh, and we'll do that when we come back after this song. Sounds like a commercial. We'll be right back. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are me.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread and the wine that we partake of this morning. We ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would sanctify these elements and make them to be to us the body and the blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, Take this and divide it among you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's all stand together and join in the song. briefly before we wrap this up, I just want to uh, say to those of you who maybe this morning was the first time in your life you asked Jesus to come into your heart and to forgive you of your sins. I have a book that I would love to give you uh, if you stop by this guest services counter and just ask them, say, can I, can I get a copy of that book? They'll give it to you absolutely free. It's a great book answering questions that you might have about faith and how to pray and how to, how to walk with God in your life. Uh, for those of you at home or watching online on the internet, if you'll go to our website, celebrationchurch.tv, and you'll see a church at home button, whatever, you can click that, and then you'll see one that says, I said yes to Jesus. You click that, it'll give us an opportunity for you to give your name and address. Uh, we're not going to bother you. We've neither the time nor inclination to bother you. But uh, what we'd like to do is send you the book, and we'll send it to you free. And if you're overseas, a lot of people watch us all over the world, and it's quite a thrill to see it. Uh, if you'll just give us your email address there. Uh, we will send you the, uh, a, a link and then you can download the book for free uh, onto your phone or e-readers or whatever like it and uh, you can get it that way into your life. And if there's anything that we can do to help you, uh, let us know. And if you have questions, let us know. Um, you have questions about the Bible, something, uh, whatever. All of you listen to me now or whatever. Uh, let me know. Mark at celebrationchurch.tv if you have a problem or complaint, it's Becky at CelebrationChurch.tv. <laughs> Everybody's a comedian. Oh, let's all stand together. <laughs> and let's pray together the uh, prayer of St. Francis uh, that we've been praying during this time. Uh, easier to pray than to do, I got to tell you. It's been so frustrating and all the conflict with people and stuff, but a prayer we need to pray nonetheless. Let's pray this together. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Heavenly Father, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a great week. 
See you next Sunday morning. Bye-bye. This is where worship starts Here in the temple of my heart Remembering who you are And all you've done This is your majesty All I have tasted and I've seen Remembering who you are And once again